What is up, Huda Nations? Training camp is finally here for the New Orleans Saints, and I'm here to talk about it with John Hendricks. We're going to discuss Michael Thomas's return. We're going to talk about Taysom Hill playing tight end, what's going on with Pete Werner, all that good stuff coming up here with Boo Crew Media's Straight Up Saints podcast and also featured with John. You're listening to the Straight Up Saints podcast. So once again, guys, we're here to talk the first day of training camp here on Buku Media's YouTube page, which is presented by DraftKings and Makers Mark. And John, the first thing that stands out, of course, is Michael Thomas coming back to the field. It feels like everyone was waiting for this moment for a very long time. What was it like being out there on the field, getting to witness it? Well, I tell you, it was unexpected, right? I mean, we talked to, to Mickey and, and Dennis Allen last night and just kind of got a sense that, hey, these guys might not be there. And we knew kind of everything I had heard. They, they weren't going to be on there long, but him being out there practicing and such and, and just being able to talk to him afterwards after practice, just saying, hey, you know, he talked to Mickey, talked to Dennis. They kind of had a meeting, expectations, did his test today. He's good to go. No limitations out on the field, looked like himself. Um, I mean, it was just such a welcome sight. And again, no matter how you slice it, day one of training camp, oh, the biggest storyline is Michael Thomas being back in the fold. Yeah, absolutely. And the one thing I love about Michael Thomas, and it's not even like the football side of things. I mean, I know we saw with the routes that he ran today, it seems like he was cutting on that ankle, which is what you want to see. But the other part of him that makes him, I would say, the the dynamic and great playmaker that he is, is kind of that chip on his shoulder he always has. And I, I'm not going to say like, hey, Michael Thomas was calling people out or whatnot, but just listening to his press conference, you could tell how badly he wanted to get back out on the field and how much it meant to him. So what was that aspect like, too? I know part of it is what we're seeing on the field, but the fact that you guys had a chance to chat with him, too, how'd that kind of go? Yeah, look, again, I think Thomas, obviously, he's not living in the past because some people ask about that. And, you know, he's only pushing forward and obviously it's hard humbling experience but you know look this guy is chomping at the bit and you talk to Dennis you talk to Mickey you talk to his teammates especially Jameis Winston I mean this guy's ready to come in and do kind of what he did in 2019 right and blow everybody away now is he going to be that player remains to be seen just because you have Chris Lave and Jarvis Landry I mean you got nothing but help but I do believe Mike Thomas is in for a bounce back season or anything short of a thousand yards maybe eight touchdowns is probably you know, or maybe even 80 catches is kind of like, yeah, I think you can probably take the over on some of that. But look, you know, just hearing him talk, seeing the passion, the fire in his eyes. And, you know, you know, as well as I do that this guy always feels slighted because five other receivers got drafted in front of him in 2016. So this guy's been waiting to get on the field. He's happy to be on the field. There's nothing, no bad blood between him and the organization that a lot of people wanted to kind of talk to about and run with. But man, he looks good. And this is just like the biggest boost that you could have for the Saints offense outside of maybe just getting Will Lutz back. Yeah, certainly. And the last thing I'll say, kind of a little fun fact before we shift gears here. Someone brought it to my attention, I believe, last week that the over-under for Michael Thomas receiving yards was at around 800 for this upcoming season. I'm like, if he's anywhere close to 100%, he's going to shatter that no problem. So we'll see what happens with Michael Thomas. But obviously, as people pointed out, MT looks hungry, and that's good news for the New Orleans Saints. Now, usually this guy's at the forefront of Saints news uh, on a normal week. It's Jameis Winston. That wasn't the case today because of Michael Thomas's return. But what did you see from Jameis? Because, of course, similar to Michael Thomas' situation, you're always trying to see those steps that they're taking throughout their injury recovery and stuff like that. So what did you kind of see from QB1 in New Orleans? Yeah, I think he's moving around well. Um, you know, again, everybody's got to remember the brace is something to stay. So he's commanding the brace this season. So obviously we saw some videos that kind of surfaced and saying, hey, he's working out without the brace. And so, look, he feels strong. He has no limitations. You know, they talked about him possibly being on a pitch count or maybe not even playing in the preseason. But James Winston said after practice, he's like, no, I want to play. It's football. Of course I want to play. You know what I mean? And just kind of having that passion. He wants to be out there. He talked a good bit about the three-day getaway he had with some of his teammates. And just tell you a little bit about who James is, is just the fact that he's, he was kind of, I'd say, Upset maybe is the word, but he was just – obviously it sucked because he's like, I couldn't spend, you know, the final parts of the season with my teammates, so I wanted to be sure I spent time with them, kind of obviously bond with them a good bit, that leadership aspect, and, of course, you get to be at the beach after you have some fun in the sun. But, look, I think Winston looked sharp today. Uh, you know, again, I think some of that chemistry is going to come, obviously, in time with Michael Thomas. But man, he he looks like he's ready to turn things on. And I, I tell you, it's 
we've it's no surprise to us i think we saw semblances of it last year i think it's only going to even grow from here but man it's it's just a good sign to see the saints being in a spot where i mean again knock on wood but they're mostly healthy right now at this point yeah absolutely and to your point it's also nice in terms of where they're at in this process because it seems like michael thomas and, and james winston will have more time to kind of gel than maybe we thought maybe months ago what that situation would be like so the fact that they're both on the field Day one is great. Now, people didn't see this. That's probably because they're not reading John's training camp observations, which they should be doing at St. News Network. Uh, and I was checking it out before. You were talking about Pete Werner. And while there's so much positive news today, maybe the one negative, and it's not a huge negative, it's just something to monitor, was the fact that Pete Werner, you said, was wa- uh, kind of working out to the side with the trainer. And then we found out that he was placed on the non-football injury list. So what do you kind of have there? Because people are wondering what the latest is on Pete Werner. Yeah, it doesn't sound like anything serious. Obviously, Dennis Allen was pretty optimistic after practice. He doesn't expect him to be out long, but, you know, I I couldn't find or see any visible limitations or anything. You know, I didn't see any braces. I didn't see anything. Of course, it could be abdominal. It could be core muscle. It could be, you know, stuff that obviously is that we can't see there. But look, I mean, he was working out without a helmet and such and just kind of doing some work. Uh, Another one that was working out was Rashid Jaheed. You know, he came in late in practice. But as far as Pete Warner, man, you know, it's obviously a a crazy sign to see that starting. But again, we'll wait until he gets back on the field. But, you know, I know a lot of people are talking about, hey, this is why you bring in Quan Alexander. He's free, you know, and something like that happens because you talked to Mickey last night. They're banking a lot on Pete Warner and his growth this season and to be that starter. I mean, Loomis said it last night. It's like, did you see him in the, the back half of the season? I mean, that's kind of their belief in him in going forward. But again, it doesn't sound like anything serious. So I expect him back here really soon. Yeah, and that's, that's great news in that regard. Pete Warner had a sneaky good uh, rookie season for the Saints. Now, if everyone, if you're listening on YouTube, you can submit a comment question for John and I, and we could bring it up. If you are listening on Twitter, come over to the YouTube link that we shared on Twitter and come and drop in a comment, question, concern, whatever you want uh, about the Saints, and we'll pull it up here. Now, the next thing I noticed that you mentioned, John, the offensive line, right? I know everyone kind of is under the assumption that right now will probably be Hurst, Pete, McCoy, Ruiz, and Ramchek. You pointed out that Landon Young actually got some reps in there. Uh, What was that like in terms of seeing the young second-year player out of Kentucky? Because he's a guy also last year got bit by the injury bug. We see him come in the Eagles game. We're excited to see what he has to uh, bring to the table. And then he gets hurt. So what did you see out of Landon Young, who's entering year two? Yeah, look, I think that was important for him. And, uh, you know, I think when you look at Landon Young, he's got a great opportunity to be a solid piece of depth. I think when you look at the tackle position, somebody that can fill in for Ryan Ramchek if something happens. And, you know, I think that's the biggest thing and important. And, you know, again, I thought he did pretty well against the Eagles. And that was the unfortunate thing because he gets hurt in that game. Uh, look, I think when you look at the tackle depth on this team, it's pinning and Landon Young, you know, they're going to have other people that are interested. And obviously I've told a lot of people, but this is James Hurst's job until it's not pinning is going to have to beat him out. Right. But for Landon Young to be able to do there, I think he moves well. I think he's got great size. Obviously, you know, when you compare him to somebody like an all pro with Ryan Ramchek, not necessarily going to be there, but man, I tell you what, I think he's he's one of those rookies that you see from year to year now I mean, in his second season that he's definitely growing and he's somebody that's looking to to get a little bit more on there. Obviously playing a little bit of special teams in there as well. And so, uh, look, I expect his roles to kind of increase a little bit here. And look, I think it's a good thing because Ramchek's coming off a knee surgery. He said he's fine, you know, obviously, but, you know, with some of these players that are coming off of that stuff, you kind of want to ease them in there. You don't want to throw them into the walls right then and there. So I think Young being there is a good sign to, for his, his development and growth. But, of course, we're not expecting him to start there. Yeah, healthy competition and more depth, like you mentioned, which is something the Saints offensive line definitely could have used last year um, You know, with all the injuries. Now, bringing up a good question here uh, from someone listening, good, good friend John Butler over here bringing up, what are your expectations for Trevor Penning? Week one starter, will they continue to groom him? Obviously, you kind of addressed that in terms of he's going to have to beat out James Hurst. And I'll kind of add my thoughts here before I, I push this one to you, John. But I think that it's good to have a guy like James Hurst in the building because we kind of forget how many starts he did have last year. He was basically not even an honorary starter. He really was a starter for this team last year because they dealt with so many injuries and constantly reshuffling the offensive line. So I think, look, if Trevor Penning doesn't beat him out week one, that's not time to kind of slam the panic button because it is a respectable veteran that he's going up against, and he is coming from a smaller school, take time to develop. And that said, uh, the expectations part different from everyone. I mean, I'm one of those people who – in the draft process, I probably like Trevor Penning a little bit better than most, I would say. Um, but it, obviously, it's all circumstantial. But for you personally, 
you get to see him up close. What are kind of your expectations if everything kind of clicks for a player of this caliber? Yeah, and the thing is, everything has to click. Uh, you know, with Penning, again, we know he's a big mauler guy. I think he's great in run support. He's got to work on his pass protection. You know, I remember back in mandatory minicamp, he, he was getting worked by Carl Grandison on back to back reps. And of course, there's a lot that comes on because now you got pads, you got engagement, you got all sorts of things that you can do. And I expect maybe a few extracurricular activities with him afterwards. But, you know, look, if he doesn't start in week one, I don't think it's a bad thing because James Hurst started a lot of games for Baltimore when he was with them, um, you know, especially between the two year stretch. And so I think Hurst has earned a shot. I think he's a strong veteran, a quiet leader in the building, very intelligent, somebody that can mesh well and protect Jameis's blind side. But look, I just remember everybody remembers how 2013 went down, kind of. You had Charles Brown as your starter, and then enough was enough for Sean Payton, obviously, and you bring in Teron Armstead against Carolina. Maybe it's a similar situation here, but I think Penning is a guy that you just have to watch and grow. And of course, he's going to have to be the one that beats out James Hurst. And again, I don't think you say if he doesn't that that's a bad thing because I believe Hurst is a guy that I feel comfortable protecting whoever's back there at quarterback. And so I think he doesn't get a lot of recognition for him. Um, I think Penning's definitely the future, but Hurst has earned this opportunity. I expect him to embrace it and be the starter when it comes to week one. Yeah, certainly. And last question regarding Ramchek, Hers, Penning, and then we'll switch it over to the defensive side of the football. This one kind of seems like a simple one for us here, but do we see Ramchek moving to left tackle if Hurst or Trevor Penning start off slow? My guess would be no for now. It seems like they've been pretty adamant about him being right tackle. John, how, how does it kind of seem there for you? Yeah, this is one of those. I think I've heard of this uh, since the beginning of like the offseason, and I never heard anything. Ramchek is going to play at right tackle. That's always been the plan. They're not going to swap them. If anything, they can swap some of these other guys if there's injuries. You know, um, you know they even have guys like Ethan Greenidge out there or Lewis Kidd. Lewis Kidd's another one. He's been working at right tackle, and they can swap him. He plays a couple different spots. But, you know, as of right now, the simple answer is no. There's no plan to move Ryan Ramchick to left tackle. He is a right tackle. That's where you need to keep him for run support and all these different things. That's that's the best way to put him. Yeah, certainly. And now kind of flipping over to the defensive side of the ball. You know, we, we know that this is going to be the strength of this team, at least on paper, and kind of carrying over from what we saw last season. But the secondary is going to look a little bit different. You bring in Tyron Matthew, you bring in Marcus May, you draft some rookie, a rookie in Alante Taylor. You also add Smoke Monday as an undrafted rookie. Overall, what have you kind of seen from, I'd say, the new safeties they brought in, Marcus May and Tyron Matthew, and our guy Talk Colado over here kind of asking about Marcus May. Expectation-wise, this is a player who looked really good with the Jets coming off an Achilles injury. What have you seen so far from, from the former Jet? Yeah, let me say this first that, you know, Cam Jordan talked and I think it's something fun to, interesting that he said today is that now he feels like this team is a defense first type team. And I would kind of agree here, right, is I think this defense has carried them a long way the past few seasons. I I really buy into that because I think they have that potential. You know, Marcus May, as far as he goes, I, I'm really excited. He can play in the box. He can play a lot of positions. He can blitz. He can do a lot of things for you. And so for him, you know, obviously there's the big thing about is he going to get suspended, right? This is a February 2021 DUI arrest. His next hearing is August 24th. It's been postponed to now, right? And so, I mean, it's something that happened in February 2021. So under the new conduct policy, that is a three-game suspension, but it depends on the timing. How does this work? What time frame is this looking at? Because if, again, it does go on the wayside, he definitely would face a three-game suspension because of it. Uh, but as far as it goes, when he's in the lineup with Tyron Matthew, I think – you look at the safety group overall, this has been the best they've been, I, I don't know how many years, right? Just from a depth perspective, from a starting perspective, not that Malcolm Jenkins wasn't great for this team or Marcus Williams, but I think Tyron Matthew gives some some missing elements to this secondary ha missing uh, over the past several years. And then Marcus May just having that versatility. And not to forget, you got P.J. Williams still. You have Justin Evans, a great comeback story you're trying to make the roster. Daniel Sorensen, Bryce Thompson, somebody who I think is going to end up cracking the final roster if he can keep putting things together and you have smoke Monday. So I feel like this is one of their deepest positions that nobody really talks about. But obviously when you look at, you know, carry over from last year's, it, it's just a new season. They got to work on the communication, which is a big thing. Marcus may talked a lot about today. Yeah, absolutely. And last time we caught up, we were talking about Alante Taylor and how he probably looked ahead of the curve in Dennis Allen's eyes. Now it's day one of training camp. It's kind of like that next step for rookies. Uh, what did you see from Alante Taylor? I know we got to see him and, and Chris Olave in a couple of cool shots that Lala got for Buku Media, but what was that like from the from the Tennessee product? 
Yeah, well, I'll tell you, um, you know, Jarvis Landry had one of the better plays of today where he caught something over the middle as an intermediate route, and it was on Alante Taylor. And so Taylor is a guy I think that, you know, uh, I've been really impressed with him. I think he could be he could be a future slot option in this team if they can't get something done with C.J. Gardner-Johnson. And so obviously I expect him to be this number four corner going into to the season. He's going to play a lot of special teams. I think he has a tremendous amount of upside He's deceptively fast. He's very intelligent. I think I like a lot of the things that he brings to the table. Tackle, it's, you know, he's able to, to do that well and just wrap up. And you look, you've put on the tape at Tennessee. You see the player and you see a lot of things because I know a lot of people are like, why would you draft a special teams guy in this, you know, early, right? And day two and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I think they're thinking a little bit more long term in, in that aspect. And I think Taylor is one that obviously looked good for in the first parts of the stages today. That's really the only thing that I noticed is that Landry, which is hard for any of the uh, Saints secondary really to defend against, that was the one play that he he gave up against Landry. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I had two more things that I wanted to get to. Unfortunately, someone actually brought it up in the chat, so it kind of makes it for a smoother transition here. How did Taysom Hill look? Because it's two parts, right? There's one part, him coming off the list Frank injury, which obviously this person wants to hear about. And then there's a second part, that he's not playing or practicing at quarterback like he was in training camp last year no QB battle for him, kind of moving to tight end in that offensive skill player role. What did you see out of Taysom Hill? Because this is a player who we know has the talent and the versatility to get this done. And if he does play well, that obviously changes the outlook for the tight end group. So day one, Taysom Hill at tight end, how'd that look? Well, let me put it this way. With him and Marcus May, you could have fooled me that they were coming off of crazy injuries like that, right? Because May looked good coming off an Achilles injury. Taysom Hill looked like Taysom Hill. I mean, he was electric. He was running around. He was doing a lot of things, made some moves at tight end. Wasn't just tight end. He was playing on punt team. He's the punt protector today. I mean, there's he's going to play these different roles. And I know DA talked a little bit about it last night, just saying, hey, you know, we expect him to possibly take snaps at quarterback, which I know a lot of people like, what are you talking about? It's those powers that he likes to run. It's those short yardage situations. I think it, it works for this team and it works until it doesn't. And then you just look at the film for the past years and you brought it up on Twitter that there are games that he closed out because of the way he's able to run when they needed to spark, he was able to get big runs off. He's just elusive, breaks a lot of tackles. I think from his hands, it's the biggest thing in, in the timing with Jameis Winston is the fact that, look, I think this could be deceptively a hard matchup for some of these guys that they put on them. And, you know, you're going to have to pick your poison with the Saints offense. If you've got Alave, Landry, and Thomas on the field and Kamara's out there and you have Taysom Hill, that's going to be tough to figure out who you have to take. And so I think Taysom can find some success. I'm not going to tell you he's Travis Kelsey or George Kittle or anything like that. But, you know, from first impressions today – I'm I'm really impressed by the way he was able to move and the fact that he's moving the way he did coming off of such a severe injury. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that, John, because I try to tell people there are three certainties in life, death, taxes, and QB power, because I've seen it <laughs> enough with Taysom Hill. Specifically, I'd say the Patriots game last year, they closed out that fourth quarter just running pretty much the same play and just changing the direction of the, the lead blocker. So if you keep that in the playbook, short yard situations, red zone situations, fourth down situations, to your point, it works until it doesn't. So we'll see what happens there. Now, the last thing that I wanted to discuss with you, John, before we kind of wrap things up. So day one's in the books. Obviously, Michael Thomas steals the show. Where do we go from here? Like, what, what are you looking for personally out of training camp that maybe changes your, your thoughts on the Saints or maybe um, validates certain beliefs you have about this team? What are you looking forward through, um, I'd say, the rest of this week and kind of going into early August? Yeah, I think some of the things that you want to look at is the continuity offense, you know, um, everybody you talk to, Pete Carmichael is going to do a heck of a job, right? And he's just so smart. He's intelligent. Uh, Mickey, again, talked about him yesterday, just kind of the belief in him and just the fact he pointed out 2012, he called plays the whole entire year and they finished second in offense, you know? So just seeing how that offense matches up against this defense, because it's always a chess match. I expect it to be a little bit more, you know, engaging, a lot more uh, – interesting as we roll around because it's the first day you don't see a ton right yeah but you know there's obviously plenty of things to take away I i'm interested to see kind of these these depth positions these second team positions you know guys like eric wilson are playing linebacker kind of doing first team doing some more reps you know are they going to edge out zach bond roster bubble player speaking of zach bond 
you know, Nick Vanette is on the second team with the tight ends right now. I know he's got a lot of pressure on him right now. And so he's one of my roster bubble players too. And then I always look at these undrafted guys who has the best outlook to make it, you know, guys like Abram Smith, Lucas Kroll, or the, the top ones I'd say, again, I've talked about Lewis kid. I've talked about him a good bit. I think he's somebody that's sneaky could potentially rise obviously, but you know, really just looking at, you know, what does it look like from this defense? Uh, I think there are question marks at tight end still, even with Taysom doing the things he's doing. I mean, I think it's it's helped answer some of those questions. Um, you know, you added Malcolm Brown to the roster. He's kind of a veteran presence that you get at running back. We'll see how that, that shapes out, you know, if it will. And, you know, how do you piece together this 53-man roster? I think that's the biggest question is you got a whole bunch of spots that you know we're going to go to. Are you going to kick it, keep – a six wide receiver. Are you going to keep four tight ends? Are you going to keep six safeties? Are you going to keep only four corners? You know, what is that number count? And I think that's kind of the jostling is you have those last maybe 10 to 15 spots that you're like, okay, this guy like Bryce Thompson is ascending one day or Eric Wilson is ascending, or maybe it's somebody else. So I think those are the things I like to pay attention to the most is just kind of the nuances at training camp. Not that, you know, how Jameis Winston does one day or another is, is important, but let's, let's face it. Last year, it was about the quarterbacks. It was Jameis Winston versus Taysom Hill. How did Jameis look when he was starting? How did Taysom look? That's that's out the window. Now you just need to know, Jameis, how is he doing? How is he progressing with his receivers? How does the offensive line look and holding up and kind of their skill position groups? And defensively, you know, I think my biggest question there is the defensive interior. Um, David Onyemata is a guy that I feel like needs to have a bounce back season. Shai Tuttle is a starter alongside of him. You know, I think Jalil Johnson and Contavious Street, the veterans they brought in, I think they they can be the third and fourth guys on this roster. But I also feel like they can push some of these other guys. So, um, you know, that's a few of them that I would say. But I pay attention to just about as much as I can at training camp. Hey, you you rattled off about 15 things, John. So I'd say you're, you're doing a pretty good job of paying attention right there. Uh, before we close it out, this is obviously the first training camp with Dennis Allen leading the way. Um, obviously, so many concerns when you go into a first year head coach situation and things of that sort. But I see a lot of negativity, not from, you know, New Orleans based, but, you know, people talking about are the Saints going to be a sleeper playoff team, whatever. And obviously time will tell that story. We don't know right now. But the vibe in the building. Does it feel similar to what we've seen the last four or five years in terms of the camaraderie, the, the winning culture that has been established there? I feel that this team is unified as one right now. And it's it's crazy just because you talk a lot about the culture and you talk about these things. I mean, this Dennis Allen is a no-nonsense guy, right? I mean, he, he's going to have some fun, but – you know, he's about work ethic. And, and, you know, I've asked him about guys like Doug Marone or, you know, I've asked players about Chris Richard and some of these other coaches. And I think the biggest takeaway is that it's it's the no nonsense. It's a tough love is that, you know, you mess up, you're going to hear about it. And I think it's all unified that this this team knows what to expect, like as, as far as a franchise and what they are trying to accomplish. It's not that, you know, you say, uh, and Mickey was asked this yesterday, this is not a rebuild. This is a roster that they believe they can win now with. And obviously they have a lot of belief on doing that and they were, they're working as one. And so it's going to take all 53 guys. And, you know, I'm trying to remember the, the message. I think it was Marcus May was talking about it, but kind of the message is Dennis Allen was talking, kind of echoing it. We're going to work as one and, and be as one and, and just kind of move through that. And, you know, these guys are not dwelling on the past. You know, Dennis was asked yesterday about, Oakland in his time. And again, I've kind of posed this to a lot of people. It's like, if you haven't changed in 10 years, you know, what are you doing? Right. I, he's not the same guy he was with Oakland. He was a year coming off a year as a, a coordinator and stuff. So, I mean, it just doesn't, just doesn't add up, but look, I think there's a lot of reasons to feel optimistic about the saints. If I was betting on him, I'd definitely take the over on the win total right now. I think quietly this team is going to show a lot of people because you know, the national media likes to say, this team's not really going to do much or go anywhere that they're going to shock a lot of people. Yeah. And look, John, you got me ready to run through a brick wall. The problem is the brick wall will lay me out harder than Demario Davis, but that's a great closing rant there. Uh, I absolutely love it. It seems like things are trending in the right direction for the saints, but still a lot more football to come, but this is a great start for the new Orleans saints. And obviously now that training camp has begun, we're basically in that football every day, all day until February, which is just the most beautiful time of the year. So very excited about that. And in order to keep up to date with everything, make sure you guys subscribe to boot crew media's YouTube page, make sure to follow John on Twitter and catch up with his work, not just for boot crew media, but also saints news network, great observations every single day out of camp. So John, thank you so much for taking the time to kind of, educate all of us real quick 
on what's going on uh, with training camp. And we'll be back here to talk more Saints throughout the week as training camp continues this week. You're listening to the Straight Up Saints podcast.